The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to Nova's presentation of I Failed My 2022 ADP Test, What Can I Do for 2023? with Steve Best. Before we get started, I would like to point out the panel on the top right-hand corner of your screen. You will see a drop-down section for questions and chat. This is where you will enter in any questions that you may have throughout the presentation for Steve. He will answer as many questions as time permits. If time runs out and you still have questions, please send them to our email address, webinars at nova401k.com. Right below questions and chat, you will see the handouts drop down. Here you will be able to download today's material. If you are with us today to earn continued education credits, please be sure to stay until the end to fill out the pop-up survey. This will allow us to track your time and participation. Certificates will be sent out within a week for those who have met the time requirements. To view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Nova401k Associates. Or you can visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you for joining us today. I would now like to introduce uh, Nova's Vice President and Shareholder, Steve Vest. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining our uh, webinar today on ADP testing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that all means. But if you're uh, on this webinar, then uh, you know your your 2022 testing failed, or this specific test did, and uh, we just want to educate you a little bit more about what it's all about, and then what you can do to help prevent it. Qu a quick disclaimer that uh, none of this is uh, intended to be uh, legal advice, and you need to consult a, a attorney or an accountant uh, if you need that kind of advice. Also, if you need CPA credit, uh, our provider number is 009820. You need to have registered individually, be present for the whole webinar, return evaluation form, and then we'll send you your certification within a week. So on the agenda today, we'll just go through a little introduction about what is the average deferral percentage test. That's what ADP stands for. Um, you know, how do we solve or, or correct uh, testing failures? You know, what can we do to maybe get you out of the test altogether? We'll talk a little bit about safe harbor plans. Mid-year testing uh, can be useful in, in some circumstances. Uh, and then some of the plan amendments uh, and testing elections you can also make in your plan document that might be able to help uh, the situations. Part of the learning objectives, we want you to understand what the uh, ADP test is all about and how refunds are actually calculated and applied. We do handle this for you, but um, you know we have a lot of clients that do wonder, you know, how are the refunds computed and who do they go back to? Um, a lot of times, your highly compensated employees will have questions about this, and it's uh, it would be nice if you can answer their questions. Obviously, you can always call us, and we can explain it to them as well, but. Uh, it's just for your information. Uh, also, you know, what are your options uh, in order to minimize refunds in the, or help the testing? And then again, uh, we'll talk about safe harbor plan designs, which can be uh, used to eliminate the requirement of this particular test altogether. I always like to go through a little diagram uh, of the service model. Uh, that you are using with Nova. Um, we call it an unbundled model, okay? Uh, but basically, in any 401k arrangement, there are typically four distinct roles that need to be played by some party, okay? And some providers will combine these roles together uh, in sort of what we call a bundled solution, um, or we can have them all separated out. But you know, you're, you're, you guys are the plan sponsors, okay? Your companies decide that you want to have a 401k plan. Part of your responsibilities are the overall fiduciary responsibility, getting your individual employees enrolled in a timely manner, getting their deductions into the payroll system, and then once deductions happen, sending the contributions into your investment providers in a timely fashion, which generally is three to five business days, okay? Um, that being said, 
these plans are heavily regulated by the IRS and the DOL, and that's where NOVA comes in as your TPA, which stands for Third Party Administrator. Uh, we're basically a consulting company, kind of like a CPA would be to an individual, where we handle all of the government compliance that you're required to follow in order to maintain your qualified plan. All right, so we'll maintain your legal plan document, which has to be updated from time to time. We prepare all of the testing based on data that you give us each year. We also prepare a Form 5500, which goes to the Department of Labor. Um, and again, that's a required form. We prep it for your signature and submission to them. And then we provide just basic consulting regarding all the various rules that uh, are involved with administering your 401k plan. Now, neither, um, and then, then we have the investment providers, and we, we have a variety of uh, investment providers that we partner with. Um, you know, uh, I'll just throw out a few names, you know, John Hancock, Voya, Empower. Um, I mean, there are many principal, um, but essentially you have to have a investment advisor, an investment provider and record keeper to send your money to, right? That doesn't, the money never comes to Nova. We don't do that. Um, and so that company provides the mutual funds, uh, the investments, the 1-800 numbers and, and internet access for people to make changes to their investments. Um, they also, you know, handle all the tax forms and people take distributions from the plan. Um, and neither uh, that company nor Nova as a TPA can give investment advice to your participants. And so that's where a financial advisor comes into play. Uh, they're able to do that and help coordinate the enrollment meetings and so forth uh, uh, for your employees and participants. Now, as I said before, the these plans are highly regulated by the IRS and the Department of Labor because they, they give preferential tax treatment to both the individuals in the plan and your companies. Uh, if you make employer contributions, the company gets a tax deduction for the employer contributions. The individuals are getting tax deductions uh, for the contributions that they personally make out of their payroll. Um, and so all of these rules and regulations are designed to protect the employees um, and uh, they have to be followed in order to maintain a qualified plan. So just a, a, I did a little introduction in terms of the testing that's required. There are a variety of non-discrimination tests. Uh, we're only going to be dealing with the ADP test uh, uh, in this uh, particular webinar, but there are about four or five different ones here that are listed that uh, NOVA will run for you when you give us your data. Uh, and you have to be compliant with all of them in order to, again, keep your qualified plan uh, uh, compliant with all the regulations. Each of the tests is designed in one way, shape, or form to test non-discrimination and make sure that your highly compensated employees that are in your plan are not benefiting disproportionately more than the non highlies Okay, so it's it's the IRS kind of doing what they do, right? They don't want the the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, and so each of these tests measures a different aspect in your plan. Some deal with the the total amount of account balances that each person has. Uh, some deal with participation rates and so forth. Um, so we're only going to be discussing the ADP test today. Some terminology uh, that will be used later in these slides uh, that you should keep in mind. The HCE stands for highly compensated employee, NHCE for non-highly compensated employee, the ADP or average deferral percentage test, and QNEC stands for a qualified non-elective employer contribution. That's a long uh, word for basically a corrective type of contribution that that your company could make in order to help pass this particular ADP test. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how that works. So what is the ADP test? So the 
common question we get from highly compensated employees that get upset about getting refunds or that they're limited in any way is that they'll go out to the internet and realize, hey, look, we, we see that the maximum limit, uh, which for 2023 is 22,500. Uh, why can't I put that much into the plan? Right? It, it, they don't understand that that part of it. Right? And the reason they cannot is because of this particular test. All right? The ADP test is a participation test that breaks the company into two groups. And uh, the, the two groups are the highly compensated employees and the non-highly compensated employees. And this particular participation test is going to look at how much on average are the highlies putting in compared to the non highlies and they're going to be restricted based on the participation rates. The highlies are restricted based on how much the non highlies are averaging in terms of contribution rates. And we'll talk, uh, I'll show you some examples of how that works. Okay. If, if the, if this testing has failed and the highly compensated employees participation rate is much higher than the non hollies then we have to fix the problem. And typically fixing the problem involves refunding some of the employee contributions back to the hollies right? Or possibly, you know, if, if, if this is optional, but um, your company could make additional employer contributions called QNEX to the non hollies sufficient to where the testing passes or some combination of the two. But you know, once a test fails after the fact and we're trying to fix it after the fact, you're pretty much limited to these corrections. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how does the actual test work? The first step, you know, we have to determine which employees in your company to include in the test. All right, so generally any employee who's eligible to participate is included. Doesn't matter if they are in, you know, uh, participating. So you're going to have people that are at zero contribution rates and you've got people that are contributing, not at zero, right? So anybody that's eligible is in the test. All right, so this includes anybody who was eligible at any time during the year including people that may not be uh, are terminated from the company and not even in the plan anymore, right? So we look at a particular plan year, which is typically a calendar year. In this case, it was the 2022 calendar year for most of your plans. And anybody that was eligible at any point is in this test. We then have to divide the company into highly compensated employees and non-highly compensated employees who were eligible at some point in 2022. All right, so who, what is a highly compensated employee? So for 20, now I'm, I'm dealing with 2023 here. The, the limits changed uh, uh, a little bit for 2023, but since we're actually in the 2023 year, uh, it's important for you to know who's going to be highly compensated in the year we're in right now. Okay. So anyone in your company that makes more than or made more than $135,000 in 2022, okay, is highly compensated this year. Now, why does the IRS look back at the prior year to determine who's highly paid? Well, they want you to know in advance who your highly paid people are. You know, that way if, if you need to try to fix things ahead of time, and we can talk about how that works, but you know, you at least know who these individuals are. You don't have to figure it out after the end of the year. Also, if you're a 5% owner of the company, it doesn't matter how much you make or how much that individual makes, they are highly paid as well, okay? Also, any of their direct family members, you know, children, spouses, parents, okay, of those direct owners, greater than 5% direct owners, are highly paid as well, no matter what they make. So you've got a compensation threshold and an ownership threshold 
that can catch, you know, either either type of, of limit can catch and designate you as a highly paid person. Everyone else is a non highly compensated employee, and this compensation threshold is indexed. For example, in uh, in for to be highly paid in 2022. It was anybody that made more than 130 in 2021. So they do change it from time to time, and we, we let you know um, what these changes are uh, right when the IRS releases them, which is usually near the end of a particular year uh, for, the, for the following year. So moving on, after we've divided the company into the two groups, we need to calculate the percent of compensation that each person is contributing? What is their deferral rate at an individual level? So for example, we have a participant that's putting in 10,600 and they also are putting in Roth of 5,000, right? So you, they, the participants can put in, in most plans, they can put money in on an employee basis, either on a pre-tax basis or an after-tax Roth basis. Either way, we add the two amounts together and we divide by the total compensation that they actually earned in the particular year. So in, if somebody actually their gross comp at the end of the year was 130, then this person contributed at a 12% rate. We then have to determine the average rate of deferral for each group. All right, so again, visually looking at it, if, if I had a very small company and I've got like two highlies and two non highlies, right? I've got everybody in the test, the zeros and the contributors. And I figure out what the average is. We've got two highlies, uh, one putting in 12%. The total of 12% is divided by two to determine the average. So in this case, we've got a 6% average for your highlies. We've got a 3% average for your non highlies. So for much larger companies, you know, you could have hundreds of people in each of these groups. Just depends on the size of your company. Steve, uh, there was a question that came in. Is there any way to limit the number of the HCEs? Yes, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the so if you have a a large number of people making more than the compensation limit, so like I've got more than 20%, for example, of my total eligible population making more than 135,000, which is a little unusual, but it, we do see it uh, in some cases. You can limit the, on the compensation limit side, you can limit your highlights to the top 20%. So if, let's say 50% of my total eligible group made more than 135, I can limit that 50% to the top 20%. So, um, you know, let's say I had 100 people, right? And I have 50 people making more than uh, 135. I can pick the top 20. So I'm not going to have to have 50 highlies. I can have 20. But that is an election in your plan document. Um, and it, it's an unusual situation to see a company with that many highly paid people, but it does happen. So other than that, no, you cannot limit, you know, you're not limiting uh, unless you've got that particular scenario in your company based on, you know, on, on pay, there's no way to limit your highlights. So now, you know, we've, we've determined the average contribution rate for each group. We have to compare it. It has to stay within certain limits for this test to pass. So how does that work? You, ba you basically get a two percentage point spread between the two averages. Now, there's a, a little nuance in the rule that says if, if your non-highly compensated average is less than 2%, you, get to mul you, you multiply by two. But if it's 2% or higher, you add two percentage points. So in this chart, for the 1% uh, uh, scenario, right, we multiply by two to get the maximum highly average of two. Once you get to 2% and above, you're adding two percentage points. So, you know, if your non-highly average is three, you get five, you know, the maximum 
average rate for the high lease is five. So in, in our previous scenario, if you recall, the highly average was six and the non-highly was three. We add two percentage points to that, we get five. So that, that particular test would fail and would need to be corrected because you're not within this two percentage point spread. So if we do fail, now we have to cure the failure. All right. And as some of you are probably at, you know, wondering, why, why does the IRS even have this test? Why, you know, why, am I why do I have a two percentage point spread? In their, in their minds, they want to motivate the employers to get their non-highlies involved in the plan. These are retirement plans. They're giving you a tax advantage. They want people to save for retirement. And if they just let the highlies contribute at an unlimited rate and not motivate or even have education meetings for their employees, they're not their non-highly compensated groups, right? Or, you know, they don't make any employer contributions to motivate them to contribute, right? Um, then, you know, basically the plan is only there for the purpose of benefiting the highly paid people, and they just don't think that's fair. So if, if they have a test like this, which is going to limit the highlies, if the non-highlies are not participating, right, it's going to get the, high, the highly compensated employees who are typically the owners of companies, um, to do something on behalf of the highly, uh, the non-highly, excuse me. So, so now we have to fix this problem. There are various ways to solve the problem, but the most common one is to refund some of the money back to the highly paid people until the, this threshold of this two percentage point spread, you know, we get within that, right? Another way that, uh, uh this can be accomplished is to have a formal plan limit. I'll talk about that later in the presentation about how that can benefit a plan. Um, but you could limit the highly paid people to a certain percentage, right? Like seven or eight percent in your plan document. And then they can't contribute more than that. All right. The other way, right? It's a participation test. So I'm either going to have to bring my highly paid people down by refunding or having a plan limit, or I'm going to have to increase the participation rate of my non highly somehow. Right. Um, you know, how do you do that? You know, if you, if you have a matching contribution, for example, now, if you match a contribution, the employer is saying, if you put in something into the plan, I will, I will put something in as well and match your contribution to some rate of pay, right? And that tends to get people involved, the non highlies involved, so that um, when they're getting basically, you know, free money from the employer for participating, right? But we've got to get that participation rate up for the non highlies to solve this testing problem. Another way is to make a, a, an employer contribution called a qualified non-elective contribution which is essentially a contribution, an employer contribution, which you get to count as if it were an employee contribution, right? So I give everybody, let's say 3% of pay. I can now count that in my, as an employee contribution when I'm averaging my rates, right? And so if you're willing to do this, uh, most employers are not, by the way, because I mean, depending on the size of your company, it can get kind of expensive. Most employers prefer to just refund money back to the, the, the highly paid people. Uh, another way is to exempt yourself altogether from this test by becoming a safe harbor plan. And we'll talk about those two types of designs. But if, you, if you're willing to commit to a certain employer contribution formula, then the IRS will exempt a plan from this test altogether. And your highly paid people can max out at the 22,500 limit. No problem, but it does cost some money. It, you have to make an employer contribution. So during, you know, if, if we are going to be refunding money, uh, so things to keep in mind, a lot of people are wondering, ah, do I have to go? Because, you know, when you were in 2020, when we were doing your testing for 2022, we were just doing that this year, right? So a lot of people are concerned they might have to go back and refile their taxes. That's not the case. The refunds are taxable in the year that they are distributed. 
So any refunds that came to your highly paid people this year are taxable this year, and they will get a 1099-R from your investment provider uh, that shows them taxable this year. Those don't get issued until January of 2024, right? Because that's when all the 1099-Rs are due, but, uh, but it's taxable this year. There's another um, requirement to get these refunds done within two and a half months of your testing year. So again, for the 2022 calendar year, that deadline was March 15th of this year. That's why you, know, you probably got a lot of annoying emails from Nova about getting your data in on time and deadlines and all of this kind of stuff. Well, we wanted to get all of the testing and refunds if they were necessary done by March 15th to save you a 10% excise tax. If you, you can do the refunds after March 15th, but now you have to pay a 10% excise tax on the refund amounts, which depending on the total amount of refunds can be quite a bit of money. All right, so we're just trying to you know make sure that you're not penalized in some way. Uh, so when you see those emails, please understand that's, that's all we're trying to do there. The refunds go back to the highly compensated employees who contribute, contributed the most in terms of dollar amounts. I'll show you what that means because this is getting down to when your highlights are going, why am I getting money back? You know, my, I contributed at a low rate of pay, right? Um, so that we'll, we'll go through why the people that contributed the highest dollar amount get the refund. All right. And the other thing to keep in mind is catch up contributions. You know, so somebody can put in 20, 20, uh, 22, five, if they're under age 50 and then somebody that's over age 50 or turned 50 during, you know, 2022, for example, could put in an extra 7,500. Actually, that's the limit for this year. Last year, uh, the catch up limit was a little bit lower, 6,500, but, but those catch ups are not counted in this testing. So no matter what happens, your highlights can always get their catch ups if they're 50 or older during the testing. Year. So how do the refunds get processed? How do they get calculated? It's a two step process. The first one, uh, involves determining what the initial refund amount in total is based on the highlies who contributed the highest percentage. Then once that total refund amount is calculated, that amount is then distributed or, or allocated back and, and refunded back to the people who contributed the highest dollar amount. Let's see what that looks like. I know it's a lot to kind of process in words. All right, let's again, let's look at uh, a, a small plan with three highly compensated employees. We have two lower paid, highly compensated employees, Steve and David. Um, in the first step of this calculation, they create the problem because you see how high their rate of deferral is. They're at 10 and 11%. So the refunds are calculated based on their percentage. Right, John, who made the most and actually contributed the most, had a fairly low rate of deferral. So step one is calculate based on the highest rate. And then unfortunately, the person that contributed the highest dollar amount gets all of it. They didn't even create the testing failure, right? Now, why, why does the IRS do it this way? Um, 20 years ago, they would have allocated the refunds back to these bottom two individuals. But back in, I forget what the date was, around 2000 or 1999, they changed it, the rule, to give it back to the person who had the highest dollar deferral rate. And I think in their minds that they thought it was more fair to punish the person that got the most benefit out of the plan, which is the person that put the most money in. Uh, you know, I've never asked an IRS agent that, but I'm sure that's what they had in mind, right? Like, why would I punish my lower paid people, you know, who put in less? I'll hit this guy here, right? We can, uh, we can argue about whether that's fair or not, but it, it's two different types of fairness, right? So now 
one way to solve this particular problem, right? To you know, if you're a fan of, I want to give the money back to the people that created the problem, right? I can actually put a formal plan limit, a percentage, in my plan document, my legal plan document, which again we we manage for you. We'd have to amend your plan and stick it in there, um, but it 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 solves for this idea of what do you think is fair and what's not. You know, if, if you don't have a plan limit, you're just going to go with the IRS's idea of what's fair, which is to to give the the highest dollar contributor the refund, right? Um, but what can happen is uh, uh, if you put a a plan limit in, not only if there were a failure, would you you give it back to the uh, or or you're limiting the people, those high percentage folks, uh, to let's say seven percent, um, and then we don't have a testing failure at all, or we have much smaller passes and fails. Okay. Now, putting a plan limit also can result in the best possible treatment of the catch-ups. And I'll show you a numerical example of this. is a little hard conceptually. Everybody's always thinking about the catch-up being the extra, let's say, $7,500 that an age 50-year-old can put in to get to like 30000 for this year, for 2023. Um, but a catch-up is technically under the IRS regulations can be created if any IRS limit or formal plan limit is exceeded, right? And then rather than take the money out of the plan, you just kind of call that excess a catch up. I'll show you what that means. It's, but, but having a formal plan limit can result in either your plan passing altogether or you just have much smaller passes and failures uh, to where you've got a, a much more predictable result, right? Um, that being said, I've had plans that have a plan limit, and sometimes your high, your your lower paid, highly compensated individuals will complain and go, "Why are we limited to seven percent or something like that?" Right? So it can have political repercussions too with your highly paid individuals. So, what's this whole idea of the catch up, and why why would a plan limit be of some benefit? So here are the exact same numbers we had before, all right? And these are the same dollar amounts, the total dollars that went into the plan. And we have to assume that these are, all three of these people are age 50. But if you're age 50, you're catch up eligible, all right? And in this scenario, we have a formal plan limit of 7%. So when we run the test, all we count in the test is 7%. Obviously, they contributed more, so that excess between the 7% and the total that they put into the plan, we can call a catch-up, right? And we don't have to refund that now. So no one's getting a refund, and your average has come down to 7%, which could easily, you know, that, that usually would pass the non-discrimination test. And then you, you have no refund. All right, so the method of, uh, we talked about this, I'm gonna go a little bit faster, let's see how we're doing on time, oh, okay. All right, so another way uh, to solve the problem if you don't wanna refund is you can always contribute a, a percent of pay uh, or some dollars to the non highlies such that we get their average up because we get to count these QNEX, these qualified non-elective contributions, as if they were employee money. Uh, and so if you're willing to make additional employer contributions to your plan, we can possibly get it to pass without having to refund money. Uh, that's always an option uh, that we put in a lot of our co correspondence if there's a failure. Um, sometimes it can get expensive though. I have to say most employers don't go with this and, and any that employer money is not subject to the plan's vesting schedule. It's 100% vested just like if it were empl employee money. Okay. Um, so. Now, what can we do? I mean, we, you know, how do we increase participation of the non-highly compensated employees? Well, you can hold additional uh, educational employee meetings, right? Again, 
this is part of what the IRS is trying to motivate employers to do, right? You know, make sure that you're you're trying to educate your non-highly compensated po uh, population about the benefits of saving for retirement, the benefits of, um, you know, compound earnings growth over many years, you know, and saving for retirement. So in order to do that, you, you know, you can definitely get people more interested in being in your plan if you're having meetings with them or you're sending them educational materials with their links to videos that can help them understand how the plan works and what the benefits are, right? Another thing you can do is, is possibly if you're making a matching contribution uh, already, we might look at uh, you know restructuring your matching contribution formula. I'll show you how that works here in a moment. You can also consider automatic enrollment and automatic increase. So automatic enrollment is a plan design feature. Again, we have to check a box in your legal plan document for you to have this, but if we do, you, you as the employer pick a percentage um, that if uh, an employee, either a newly eligible employee or a pre-existing one, um, does not make an affirmative election to participate, then you will automatically enroll them at a certain percentage into your plan. So if I had an automatic enrollment percentage of 6%, and I've got, I'm offering my plan to a group of new people and a bunch of them just make no election. And I, you know, they can elect zero, that's fine. But like, you don't get any response from a few of them. You automatically put them into the plan at 6%. You put a 6% deduction in payroll. They can opt out, but you're, you're kind of, I hate to use the word forcing them in the plan, but you, you kind of are. Um, the IRS is a massive proponent of this. In fact, the new legislation that came out with the Secure 2.0 Act uh, here in the last uh, month or so, every plan, every new plan, after, I forget what the deadline is now, but in, in the next couple of years, every single new 401k plan that is put in place will have to have an automatic enrollment feature. It will be required. So that, you know, anybody that has a plan currently is, is uh, grandfathered, so you don't have to have that in your plan. Um, in addition to having automatic enrollment at 6%, you could also put in your plan that uh, not only does it start at 6%, but every year we're going to automatically increase you 1%. Now, you can imagine, you know, what, what's happening in the test itself I've got all those zeros. Those zero people are bringing my average down and making my test fail. If I can automatically enroll them at a certain percentage, I'm eliminating zeros and raising that average, and that's how I help my plan pass. So it's just something to consider. If you're ever interested in putting an automatic enrollment feature into the plan, uh, just contact your Nova account manager, and they can. We are going to have to amend the plan. Uh, and change some things at your investment provider as well uh, to update their, because they're, they're tracking the plan provisions as well. But Now, what, what do I mean by matching formula restructuring? All right, I've seen this before where, you know, an employer is making a match and they're, they're doing 100% or dollar for dollar on the first 3% that an employee puts into the plan, right? Well, if I change that formula and make it, 50 cents on the dollar on the first 6%, the total outlay of money that you as an employer would have to make is exactly the same because both formulas, the maximum percentage any one person will ever get is 3% under each formula. But in the second one, I'm motivating the individual to put in six if they want to get all of the employer money. The first formula is just motivating somebody to put in 3%. So again, the whole idea is if I can get the non highlys putting in more, I'm going to, I'm going to help pass my test, right? And changing your, you know, analyzing what kind of a matching formula you're, you're, you're making and possibly changing it because most of the, most of the matching formulas are discretionary. You can just come up with whatever you want. Um, but are you really motivating your people to put the highest percentage in? And if not, look at that, you know? Again, your Nova account manager can help you maybe come up with an idea here, but 
this is a pretty typical one here. So what if I want to be completely exempt from the test? You can do that. It's called a safe harbor plan design. Again, this is an election in your legal plan document where we check a box and you, you can elect this on a year to year basis. All right. Um, but if you're willing to commit to a certain employer formula, um, there's some other caveats we'll go into in a moment, then you can be exempt from the ADP test and all your highlights can put in as much as they want up to the limits, right? There's a matching variety and a non-elective variety, a, a non-elective profit sharing variety, okay? So the match, if you're willing to commit the basic formula of dollar for dollar on the first 3% that an employee contributes plus 50 cents on the next 2%, you know, you, you can become a safe, you know, you, that is the formula that gets elected when you, you elect safe harbor match. All right. It is a match. So it only goes to the people that are contributing. Anybody that's still at zero is not going to get any part of this contribution. Um, now the key, idea with any of these matching formulas is that um, all the money is 100% vested. So not only do you have to commit to the formula and stick to it, but your plan's vesting schedule does not apply to it like it does a discretionary match. This is a non-discretionary match. All right. And you have to commit to it for at least one year. You can elect out from year to year, but if you know, you have to stick to it to one for your one year. The other variety is the non-elective safe harbor contribution, which is a 3% of pay to all eligibles. Doesn't matter if they are contributing or not. If they are eligible to contribute, that entire group gets 3% of pay. All right. So depending on, you know, contribution rates and, and so forth, this can be more expensive, right? But it is an option. There's a third type, which is a combination of the prior two um, and automatic enrollment. It's called a qualified automatic contribution arrangement. Um, it does have a slightly different formula, and, and the one advantage it does have over the other two is that there is a very short vesting schedule to the employer contributions you make if you elect becoming a quacka safe harbor, okay? Um, there's a two-year cliff vesting schedule, all right? So they have to be 100% vested after two years, but before that, they're zero. And if you have a high turnover population, you know, you can recoup your money, right? Because if people are 0% vested, if they happen to terminate and take the rest of their money, um, you as a company get your, your employer contribution back. Um, now, the formula is a little bit cheaper as well. The, the matching version is dollar for dollar on the first 1% that somebody contributes, plus 50% on the next 5%, which if you do the math, it's going to cap out at 3.5%. The other one, the other match, capped out at 4 right? So if somebody puts in at least 5% of the other one, they would get a 4% match. And this one, um, if they if they put in at least 6%, they're going to get a 3.5% match. So the, the formula is a little bit cheaper, but not much. The safe harbor non-elective is the same, 3% of pay. Now, what about the timing? So, you know, maybe you like what you hear, or you think you might like becoming a safe harbor plan. You know, what when can I change over to that type of plan design? All right. So with the match, it's too late for this year. All right. They have to be matching elections have to be made before the plan year in which you're going to be safe harbor starts. So if you want to possibly become a safe harbor match, you need to let Nova know no later than November 1st of this year. And then you would, become a safe harbor, you start making your safe harbor matching contribution in 2024 and be exempt from the ADP test in 2024. All right, so there's there's no changing at mid-year right now. 
With the non-elective variety, the IRS changed the rule a few years ago to where you can elect this mid-year, this year. And it would be retroactive to either the current year or even a prior year. So how does that work? If I want to become the non-elective safe harbor design for 2023, I need to make that decision and amend my plan by November 1st of this year. And the 3%, it's retroactive. It's not like, oh, I get to pay the 3% from November 1st to the end of the year. No, it doesn't work that way. You're, you will pay the 3% on the entire 2023 year's worth of compensation for your eligible group. All right. Um, they will even let you, the IRS will even let you become a non-elective safe harbor plan retroactive to a prior year. So I can be in 2024, maybe realize, hey, I, I failed my testing again, right? I could actually make the election to be safe harbor for that testing, the 2023 testing year um, in 2024, but the price I pay is uh, it's going to be a 4% contribution, not a 3% based on the entire 2023 year. So, so they, they allow retroactive and mid-year adoptions of this variety of safe harbor. Now, mid-year testing, uh, this is completely optional. The ADP test and all those other ones that I had listed earlier are required by law. Um, but if you want to get a feel for where you're at in terms of your ADP testing, one of the optional services that uh, NOVA offers is to do a mid-year test, right? We, we do send you emails, uh, and they'll be probably going out in the next three months or so, uh, about this, this mid-year testing. But what we do is we, we just take your data year-to-date for 2023, we'll annualize it, and run a kind of a mock test to see, are we, are we going to be passing this year? Are we not going to be passing, right? Uh, and then you can either allow you or tell your highlies that, hey, we're expecting another failure, expect refunds, you know, so it's, it's good for communication and expectations on those highly paid key employees in your, in your plan. Um, but just watch out for the, uh, the notifications if you want it uh, to, to take advantage of this testing. It does cost extra. Um, I think, I'm trying to think, the fee is probably like, Depending on the size of your plan, it's anywhere from about five hundred dollars uh, to a thousand, depending on how many people are in the plan, and it just takes more time to run large, large groups. But um, it is an optional test. Now, you know why? Why might I do uh, some mid-year testing? Well, there are some abilities in the plan to change the testing methods that we use in the ADP test. Um, the problem is you can only make those changes during the, the, the year you're in. So if, if I was going to get some advantage out of changing a testing method, I had to make that decision now for the 2023 year, but I don't even know if I'm passing this year yet, right? So we run the test. I, I have had a plan that um, I did a mid-year test for. Um, we ran it both both methods, and one failed and the other one passed. So we were able to get the amendment in on time to make the change and get them to a passing method uh, by doing a mid-year test. If you, it's too late after the plan year closes, after you're past 1231, 2023, uh, to do something like that. Um, also, if you want to put in a plan limit, that requires a plan amendment. This top 20% rule that we talked about before, right? If you've got a lot of highly paid people, like more than 20% of your group is making more than 135, then we can put this extra election in there and that might help you pass. Right? And obviously the safe harbor plans require a plan amendment. Something to keep in mind, um, all the limits do change. From year to year and I think we've sent out some correspondence earlier this year or actually we usually do it in December before your plan year begins that's 
that's usually when the IRS releases any new limit changes and indexes uh, uh, for the for the next year. So, but just keep in mind to update your payroll system. Um, my title here is wrong. It should say updating 2023 limits in payroll. Sorry for the typo there. But for 2023, somebody under the age of 50 can put in 22,500, uh, 22, and somebody that's 50 or older can put in 30,000. You do not have to track the catch-ups separately from any other deferral. Okay, it's just a different maximum amount based on age, right? So 50 year olds can put in anybody that is 50 year older or turning 50 this year can put in 30. That's, and you wanna have that limit in your payroll system so they don't go over it, okay? There's something else at play here too. If you're making a match, there's a maximum compensation limit that's also indexed every year. And for 2023, that limit is $330,000. That means if you've got a highly paid person that makes a million dollars for plan purposes, these 401k plans, we can only count $330,000. Now, why is that important? If you're making a match, you have to limit, there's a maximum dollar amount based on your matching formula. So, for example, if you had a 100% up to 4% formula, then you take 4% of 330,000 and the maximum dollar amount that any one person can ever get is 13,200. You, you should put that into your limiter in your payroll system. And again, because the matching formulas can all be very different, your dollar amount limit in your payroll system may be completely different than any other companies. A different formula, which is very popular, 50% on the first 6%. Well, that caps out at 3%. Right? So you take 3% times 330,000, we get $9,900. That's the, the most anybody should ever get. And the minute they hit that dollar amount on their match, your system should cut them off. I have seen some, this last bullet, I have seen some payroll systems um, where the system will cut the person off when they hit the $330,000 in earnings. That's not how you do it, you know? You don't, you don't have to cut somebody off when they hit that dollar limit. It's just that the dollar limit creates the maximum dollar amount, okay? If you're with ADP payroll, that's the, that's the company. I've seen the bottom bullet happen. And that, you know, basically it results in people getting cut off early. If you think about it, if I'm a highly and I become eligible in the last six months of the year, right? Um, you know, I should be able to put in the maximum, right? It's like, so there, there's reasons why it, it, it shouldn't work when, when you hit the 330, $30,000 dollar, you know, so something to keep in mind. Um, hey, Steve, we had a, a question come in. Um, if yeah, sure. the ADP fails, what is the latest date to pay the 10% excise tax? And what if this date is missed? Um, yeah, so basically you have until March 15th, after March 15th, but before December 31st. So again, we're talking about a 2022 testing year. I have until March 15th of uh, 2023 to not, to kind of be exempt from the 10% penalty. Then from March 15th to December 31st, I can still make the refund with no additional penalties, but I do owe the 10%. Um, the 10% is owed. Technically, you're supposed to make, I've never seen the IRS enforce a deadline on that particular penalty. I mean, it, we've had clients where they didn't do testing for two, three years. I mean, they're way behind, right? And when we calculate the 10%, we still go ahead and submit it, even though it's late. And I've never seen the IRS impose any additional penalty for that. Um, now, after if you miss December 31st, like, or let's say December 31st of this year, um, not only do you have to make the refund and owe the 10%, but now the company has to make a contribution to the plan, employer contribution to the plan, equal to the amount of the refund. 
that are being done beyond one plan year of your testing year. So we definitely never want to miss that deadline. But any other questions at this point? Uh, yeah. Um, can you discuss the pros and cons of capping HCEs and refunding HCEs? Yeah, so if you put a formal cap in your document, like I said, that the pros are that you can you you can get some advantage for your age 50 year olds on their catch ups, right? Because let's say I put a again, I'll just seven percent cap. The way you run that in payroll is for a, a 50 year old, they put in seven percent of their pay. And they can also put in the full 7,500 in catch up. That, that's what they get to put in, right? Anybody that's under 50, they put in 7%. But having this cap, it, you know, the advantage is you, you could see in the prior slide, the owner, let's say the owner was a guy making 305, he was getting all the refund, right? If I'm an owner, I don't, and I am an owner, I don't like that solution, <laughs> you know? Um, because my lower paid highlies are, you know, they're causing my testing failure and I'm getting hit, right? I'm not causing the problem. So if I want to solve for that problem, I put in a limit. Now the con is my lower paid key people, which may be very important to my company and I don't want to upset them. They're probably going to be upset. Why do we have a 7% limit in our plan, right? I mean, I could try to explain that to them, but they're still not going to like it, right? So it's a trade-off between, you know, upsetting my lower paid highlies, right? And sort of benefiting myself as, a, or, you know, benefiting the, the people that make the most money. So do I, do I, you know, kind of upset my lower paid highlies or do I upset my higher paid highlies? You know, I mean, I, I don't know. You'll have to answer that as a company. But that, that's basically it. Right, we had uh, somebody comment on the previous question. Um, they said, per the Form 5330 instructions, the 10% excise tax is due by July 31st, uh, seven months following the end of the plan year. Yes. So that's a good point. So there's no way to make that deadline, is there? Right? I mean, it's like, uh, I think it's actually March 15th. I think it's March 15th. So if I'm, if I'm in 2022, uh, we're not even going to have your refund computed in time. You know, let, let's say you missed the March 15th deadline. We may not even have your refund computed in time for you to pay the penalty by that deadline. Okay. Again, I've never seen the IRS. We, we just fill in the 5330 or whatever 10% of the refund amount is if you miss the first deadline. And we have never, I've, I've never seen the IRS come back and say, oh, you, you, you didn't make your 5330 deadline. Here's an additional penalty for that. All right, and the last question, I think you, you pretty much just answered it. Um, for refunds after the 315 deadline, is a form 5330 required? A 5330 is, is, is an excise tax form that handles a variety of excise taxes, including this particular one. Uh, so you always have to file a 5330 to get that tax paid. Basically, we fill it in for you. You write the check to the United States Treasury, and then both those things get sent in to the IRS. So, I mean, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but yeah, 5330 is always required to be sent in with your excise tax payment. Awesome. Um, I think that's it. Uh, somebody just uh, commented on the previous one that says, uh, actually, it is 15 months after plan year end. 15 months. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that would be. Yeah. That sounds correct. All right. And, and that's all the questions. All righty. Well, Thank you, Steve. Um, and then uh, just a reminder to everybody to go ahead and fill out the pop-out survey at the end of this webinar, and this will help us track who will be needing a certificate. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us at webinars at noah 
www.ncpk.com um, to view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session. You can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Nova 401k Associates, or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you, Steve, for your time today. Thanks again to everyone for joining us. So we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.